So we're really thrilled to have Amelia and thank you for coming tonight. And I'll invite her to introduce our uh, panel to you. Thank you. I always feel like microphones aren't on whenever I'm here with them. I don't know why it's this weird thing I have. Um, anyway, thank you so much for having me here. It's a real pleasure. Um, and like Rod said, I have spent almost five years now working at BTN, a little update. And uh, if, I think if it wasn't for the arts and if it wasn't for the fact that I had um, you know, study drama and visual art when I was uh, in high school, I really don't think I would be in the position I'm in now. Um, I was actually a very shy kid and it was uh, one of my primary school teachers who I will never forget who actually gave me the confidence to become uh, good at public speaking. And so I really credit teachers with so much. Um, it was my English teacher in high school who really helped me to learn how to write and uh, you know, hone my skills and realise that that was something I was good at. So um, a big credit to all the teachers out there. You're doing a great job. So tonight um, we are going to hear from these wonderful panellists. Um, to begin with, I would like to introduce Ross, Ross McHenry. Now Ross is a multi-award winning composer and electric bassist whose work seeks to reflect the unique and changing cultural landscape of Australian creative music within the context of an increasingly interconnected global musical landscape. So Ross achieves this through significant international collaborations and performances with leading artists across Australia and across the world. Since graduating from the Elder Conservatorium in 2007, Ross has performed extensively, like I said, around Australia and around the world, collaborating with many well-known artists. Ross has uh, performed at leading arts festivals, including the very awesome Glastonbury, must have been a lot of fun, Sydney Festival, Falls Festival, Slender and the Grass, Wellington International Jazz Festival, Whew, the list goes on and on. So um, I would really like to, oh, I'll say one fun thing actually, um, Ross is a current recipient of the Martin Bequest Fellowship and in February 2019, um, he, I assume, premiered a major new sym symphonic work with the Adelaide Symphony Orchestra. He will also be featured, uh, a featured soloist with the orchestra in this program. So he possibly might be doing that right now. I'll let you tell us more about what you've been doing and how um, the arts have influenced your life. Hello everyone. Hi, there's, there's some familiar faces in the room and it's, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so I'm just going to talk generally about how the arts and arts education have impacted my life. Well, I mean, I think it goes uh, without saying that it's had a profound impact on my life. And I think that, um, you know, the arts is really the framework um, through which I interpret and come to terms with the world around me. And I think that um, for many young people, um, even though they might not be able to uh, put forward that idea in, uh, in the same way, the, the same is true in fact, for all young people with an interest in the arts. You know, music for me, um, as a young person, it meant everything to me and I desperately wanted to be involved in it in any way I could. But I wasn't, um, although I started playing music at a relatively young age, I didn't really find the uh, the mode of music that came to be my own for a long time. I didn't start playing the instrument that became kind of my main instrument um, until I was well into high school. And so the great teachers that I had um, were instrumental in, in, um, in helping me to achieve something that I knew that I wanted to do, but I didn't know how to do um, from you know, from a, from a very early age, and also looking and kind of putting me together with people who became very important to me in, in my artistic journey. So, um, yeah, I, I, I don't know, I could go on, but I think that may be enough for now. That's lovely for now. Can we please actually give Ross a round of applause and welcome him? Okay, so our next speaker has a visual arts perspective. Philip, with an F, odds up, always. I've known Philip for many years actually um, and have worked with him on other occasions. And Philip's uh, studying at Dawes Row High School with a focus.
focus on dance, drama and visual art, very similar to me, before completing a Bachelor of Visual Communication at UniSA. Since finishing his studies, Philip has flourished in the world of fashion and events. Some of uh, Philip's current roles are music director for Adelaide Fashion Festival, DJ, MC, fashion commentator and runway producer slash coordinator, editorial director and stylist, and he's also done wardrobe for TV, menswear fashion designer, director of uh, bowtielabel.com, romsquad.com.au, <coughs> and currently, as if that list wasn't long enough, Philip is marketing manager of ITD, which is an inter international entertainment platform. I think he can definitely explain what that is to you. What that is? ITD in the dark. I'm currently the marketing manager. Um, essentially, at the moment, our biggest asset, we tour around drag queens. Um, <laughs> RuPaul's Drag Race is a cultural phenomenon at the moment, and we tour them around Australia, New Zealand, and Asia. And um, they are making money. They are one of the biggest things in the world right now. And if you had told me 20 years ago that I'd make a living out of drag queens, I would never have believed you. I don't think I've ever seen one yet. Um, but um, it's been quite a road to get there. Um, I really enjoyed the guest speaker earlier, and I think there's a lot of context that comes from when we are at school and what we take from those experiences and why we are experiencing that. Um, when I think back, to my interest in literature and the arts, it was usually a form of escapism or I was looking for truth. I came from a very religious upbringing, which means I was super sheltered and there was, very, there was a lot of strictness around me. So when there were things that I went, wasn't allowed to know, prime example, six years old, I wanted to know where babies came from. My father told me some weird bullshit story. <laughs> and what did I do? I went straight to the library, got out the encyclopedias, and learned about reproduction. That's what I did. I was on the hunt for truth, and the English, English language, learning, literature, was my way of finding truth. And the arts was my way of escaping. So in high school, drama and music and visual arts also turned into extracurricular activities, and that kept me at school and kept me social. Otherwise, you know, it would be back home for Bible study and all that, which also wasn't bad because reading the Bible as a child helped me become more literate and articulate. So, I mean, it all had, you know, it all led to where I am now in, I guess, the world of entertainment. What I probably didn't realize then which now impacts my career so much um, these days, is that my passion and my real knowledge was in the world of popular culture. That's why I loved art so much. That's why I loved drama so much. Um, and now I've, I've worked with so many different types of cult, pop culture, phenomenons. Um, and in the end, really what the arts did for me was give me a sense of community. So what I do outside of that, and actually what a lot of what I have done in my career has been very connected to community. Uh, prime example is in drama class there was no segregation. In my school there was an action annex, there was a sense of hearing impaired, and then just the rest of us. And we were separated everywhere but in drama class. In grade 12, the hearing impaired girl played the line in the line which in the wardrobe. Now, I don't know if she heard herself growl, but she was the loudest cast member. And from there on, I think my sense of community was always very strong. Um, and that has always led to, what would I say? Um, um, my involvement in um, off, off the clock um, charity, charitable work. Um, and I've always set myself goals, and I've always, always um, found myself um, currently, one of our assets that we own with ITD is a bar in the city called Mary's Poppin. I don't know if anybody's familiar with this. I'm currently the venue manager for that bar, which has placed me in a position of being a community leader and a role model to the LGBT, but also to the other communities that I want it to be a safe space for, which is um, anybody on the spectrum and people that have any kind of impairments or disabilities. 
disabled community is also a community that's very important to me. Um, I recently lost a very close friend last year who was a disability advocate and I feel like I've inherited a lot of his projects through that. So that's all come from this place where I got my knowledge and my sense of community. That's, that's what the arts did for me in school. Maybelline is a well-rounded performer and an avid member of Gleason College's Performing Arts Department. She joined the competitive concert choir in year eight, also pursuing saxophone in stage band and filling the musical roles of Frenchie in Greece. That was always my dream role, never got to play it. <laughs> and Sweden in the school's Eurovision Song Contest. In 2018, she performed in the class of Cabaret and on June 19th, returns to the Adelaide Festival Theatre as part of the Green Room Speak Easy. Maybelline, can you tell us a little bit about your experiences with the arts? Yeah, so um, my name's Maybelline, like the makeup. So um, <laughs> I'm still obviously currently at school, so my journey's a bit different. If anything, I guess my professional career, if I pursue it is only just starting. So my main achievement and my big debut, I suppose, was in the class of cabaret. So I had a lot of aspirations starting from year eight. I chose to go to Gleeson College for their arts program, and I was obsessed. I was always looking up to the senior students, and from year eight, I quickly joined the senior choir. So I felt like I had immediately gained a sense of community and in year nine I had more year 12 friends than I had people in my own year level. So I just had this big group behind me whether it was in musical, whether it was in band or any other place in the school community, I just had my performing arts family and I think that's kind of the most important thing to me and uh, in Gleason it's a very strong performing arts department in terms of family. Now, in link to my class of cabaret, there were senior, two senior girls who had been part of the class of cabaret, so I was kind of walking in their footsteps, but I didn't realise what this program, how it was actually life-changing. So I auditioned for it, and it was a two-audition round kind of thing, and this program is actually in conjunction with SACE, so it's not just focusing on your performing, you actually do a say subject. And I thought it was really interesting listening to how the cur curriculum is so hard to decipher. And the subject creative arts at my school is very hard to achieve well in. But when I did it through the program, I got a stage two A, being at a uh, stage one level. So I thought that was very handy because we did have a teacher who was a moderator. That was super handy. Um, <laughs> in the class of cabaret, what you do is it's a five month program done through the Festival Theatre. And you are trained by um, top people in the industry. So Amelia Ryan and Michael Griffiths are your main mentors. And they are like cabaret royalty, basically. And so you have like weekly slash fortnightly sessions with them. And you write your own 10 minute set uh, to perform in a one night only show. Uh, aside from that, your other mentor is Charmaine Jones and she is a vocal powerhouse in Adelaide. She is from Jackson. She did, um, she's in the Gospel Collective and she did Jackson vs. Jackson at Fringe. So I being thrown into this and that's immediately starting your networking. I didn't understand the term until I joined this program and you meet so many people and from that more opportunities open and so many doors open and I wouldn't have been able to do that unless my school had recommended or pushed me to it. So I think arts is extremely important not only for uh, developing you as a student <coughs> and grades wise but actually as a person making friends and a sense of community and I don't know where I would be without not only in school uh, performing arts as well as the opportunities, opportunities outside of that. <coughs> International High School back in 2014 with an ATAR of 99.15. But rather than following the academic path, Henry became a filmmaker who has produced dozens of short films which have screened and been awarded 
uh, at numerous film festivals in Australia, Europe, Africa, and the United States. Uh, so it includes, uh, let's say we've got Milan Fashion Week, the Melbourne International.
uh, it's the same thing, not so really rich Bernie was like better at being a businessman. I would do all the other things, but actually conducting myself as a part of business was something that took a lot, maybe too long and maybe too much experience to finally get there. Um, but assertiveness and, and being a bit more headstrong because when you're working in a very creative field, you're just get them stepping on toes when you want your dollars. And um, you know, they can go anywhere else for a cheaper price, but probably a shit of product. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's more probably other life skills, really. But assertiveness in, in all areas. Um, but I was really afraid of failure and humiliation and all those other kind of things, which is probably normal for anybody in the arts. Um, but then my greatest successes came from not giving a damn and believing in my vision and doing it. So their lessons learned just, I guess, through experience. I think being in year 12 now and doing um, art subjects, a lot of it is assumed you know what you're doing. The teacher assumes you know how to act and this is your role, you act it. And as much as I, uh, I had very talented classmates and we all worked together and put our product out, I would have loved to learn skills to make me a better actor or make me a better singer. I feel like it's very much assumed you know how to act so you just do it and I want to learn more. I have such like a thirst for knowledge and I think that's maybe missed out in younger, in younger years maybe you build that up but then again that's when opportunities may be taken away from you. I know at um, year 10 we couldn't have a drama class because we had not enough people but then another subject had the same amount of people and it went ahead. So that's the disadvantage you get in arts. So maybe opportunities in hand um, with just learning those foundation skills and maybe continuing that through the senior levels and not just assuming. You know what would have been interesting actually? This would fit into like the CS Media Studies or even CS Creative Arts curriculum. Um, like as well as teaching, as assessing the work as a finished product, I think an additional assessment where you assess the market viability of this thing that you made would be very valuable, which is kind of like figuring out how to be a business, right? Because that's what I have to think about now, right? I made a film, why would people watch it? Maybe someone that's famous that's in the film, okay, maybe they'll watch it for that. How do I get funding? Yes, if this is on Asian Australians, okay, so maybe I'll get funding from this organization, or maybe I can write about this in my grant application from this organization, because I know they have a history of being interested in multiculturalism. So that kind of thing, just thinking from that perspective, even from like year 12 or year 11 would be very valuable, because you don't even have to go as deep as that, right? You've made the film, um, or you've made the work, whatever it is, a painting, just write a little 500 word summary on why you think that piece of work uh, would be bought by someone, or why would someone invest their money into funding you to have made it, or what sets it apart from other people's work, right? That would have been actually a really good thing to have um, back then. Yeah, and the only other thing is just, yeah, this, the, the thing I mentioned before with the entrepreneurism, this kind of ties into that, like, admittedly I did not do maths in year 11 and 12, so I don't know whether this was covered in maths here in Australia, but I've been, I visited schools in the US, uh, one in Midtown Manhattan that was a high school that was really affluent. It was like, oh, even Midtown is the Upper West Side closer, so it's like really, really rich area. And I went to one in Queens that was much, much like less socioeconomically viable. And it's so interesting just to go into their maths classes because in the one in Queens, the kids were being taught how to save money, whereas the one closer to the Upper West Side on, on the island, they were being taught to invest. And so it's like, right from the beginning, all the way back in primary school, this was high school, but I'm sure like primary school you can start introducing these thoughts. If you teach the kids how to invest as opposed to save money, it's the mindset is just completely different. Whether you're doing arts or you're doing something else, it's like you just think about every dollar that you have or every minute of the day that you've got as a, as a, as a way to invest into something, as opposed to being like, oh, I need to hold on to it because that's all I've got. It's like, it would just change a whole bunch of different things, I think. Um, having to be adaptable, having to network, having to market, have to learn to market your products, um, having to change directions and change tax. Um, I, I think as an arts industry, um, we talk about like prioritising arts compared to other, other professions. I think other professions probably do things like a lot better than the arts do. What, what do the arts in terms of, um, I guess, if you think about artists that don't make it, 
you know, you, a lot of the time you get graduate from art school, you guys are having to be almost like um, industry leaders in order to have a career. Um, whereas, say, a doctor, they go to school, get their degree, leave, and they've got a guaranteed profession. So what are we not doing in the art industry that other industries do much better? I don't know if it's that other industry is doing it better. I think it's how the person manages it. What I found within the entire field of the arts is a lot of the artistic assets are the same. So I've jumped around a lot. I went from fashion and, and then and, and production and media to now I'm in music. And uh, <laughs> uh, take it, no, I need some. No, I, you know, uh, then, you know, somehow I started way over there in the field, but then I'm music directing and just. I choose next month. It's a remix for Gamble from Real Housewives of Melbourne. <laughs> um, um, sure, it's going to make number 66 on the charts. So I'm going that, that 30% from the iTunes sales, I'll probably get a good 30 cents. Um, but, you know, I've ended up over there, whereas I started in graphic art. Like, I was typesetting and I was doing publication. Like, well, how did I get there? How did I get there from, to fashion? And then how did I get from fashion to this? The assets are really, the creative assets are all the same. It's knowing how to use them, adapt them, and be adaptable. And then it really applies to everything else. That's what I found. Well, you've already clapped, so I can't say you do that. But <laughs> uh, thank you so much to our panelists. We have Ross McHenry, Phil Bodzak, Maybelline San Juan, and, oh. Sorry. <laughs> um, and oh my god, I've just gotten completely blank. Harry? Henry Tom. Henry Tom. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> My bad. It was the McHenry and the Henry and the Henry. <laughs> Henry Tom. Extra, extra class. For ever